I don't like it when Ethel talks to Beulah about me. I looked at the lady that made that comment to make sure that I heard her correctly, and that's what she said. I don't like it when Ethel talks to Beulah about me. It was a comment made in a small room at a community session on social housing. And that's when I learned the following truth. Discovering and accepting the worth of people who don't think like you do leads to better decisions and better policy. My client was doing consultation to establish direction for social housing in their community. This included the municipality's women's shelters, homeless shelters, and their senior citizens' lodges. Because we believe that better decisions are made when people most affected by the decisions have a say in making the decisions, I found myself leading discussions in a group that included policymakers, administrators, and two fluffy little old ladies aged well in their 90s, residents of one of the local senior citizens' lodges. I imagine that at some point in the day, somebody say, hey, do you want to go on an outing? And they, so eager to be sprung from life's daily routines, grabbed their coats and found themselves in my session, discussing social housing policy of all things with a bunch of suits. So, although the questions were asked of the group as a whole, dialogue was mostly between the policy makers and the administrators. And even when the general public chimed in, discussion was still at a fairly high technical policy level. I tried to include all the members in on the discussions. One of the ways that I do this is instead of just waiting for everyone to respond, I ask that I get one response from everyone around the table when I ask the question. So although one of the little old ladies had offered the occasional response, the other hadn't commented yet. To tell the truth, she seemed to me to be a little bit vague and somewhat disoriented and hadn't seemed to be following the conversation very well. I had made the assumption that the discussion might have been a little bit beyond her, but if she had something to offer, I would give her the opportunity, even if she didn't have the desire, to be able to contribute to the conversation. My question to the group was something along the lines of, what challenges do we face when providing social housing? When it was time for her to respond, and you have to remember, everybody's using some pretty technical language at this point, she responded with, I don't like it when Ethel talks to Beulah about me. There was a dead stop in the discussion at that point. Did she even hear the question? Did she know what we were talking about? Was she talking to us or to an imaginary friend? I looked at the group to get my cue from them, and one person even rolled their eyes at me, so no help there. Now, what I could have done was just take her comments, seemingly out of context, and write it up on our flip chart so we captured it, and then move on to the next response. But for a moment, I had a little ethical dilemma. As part of getting the group set up for the event, I establish and read out working assumptions. These are like a uh, bit like ground rules for working together respectfully in sessions like this. You can read more about these by following Joe Nelson's blogs. Joe is with ICA Canada. Many facilitators will have a variation of these. Mine goes something along the lines of the following. Everyone has wisdom. We need everyone's wisdom for the most meaningful results. Everyone will hear and be heard. You can change your mind. And there are no wrong answers. Now, I always include a sixth of my own. It goes like spelling doesn't count, because invariably through the course of the evening, somebody will tell me that I had a remark on my creative spelling style. So, here I'd set up with the group to be respectful of everyone's contributions, and I had this little ethical dilemma where I was feeling like I wasn't honoring this lady's wisdom. So instead of just writing down her comment, I asked her a question. 
who is Ethel? And she responded to say, Ethel is one of the residents. At this point, I think I got a small groan from one of the other participants. So I quickly asked, who is Beulah? And she said that Beulah was the lodge matron. Now, here was something. Did she mean that the lodge matron was listening to some of the gossip from the other residents? No, this lady responded. She was saying that the administrator of the lodge was telling another resident about her medical condition. So now all of a sudden there's silence in the room, but not because of the type of the response that this lady gave, but because she proceeded to describe an egregious violation of confidentiality. At this point, the group started to become engaged with her. They started asking her questions, accepting what she had to say, and listening to her experience. And as a result of that, they came up with some very good policy recommendations regarding confidentiality and respect that they were not going to come up with before. So now I've shared a story with you that shows how discovering and accepting the worth of people who don't think like you leads to better decisions and policies. Let me now share with you why I think that this is important. We live in complicated and volatile times. Problems and issues seem multifaceted, and solutions, if they are to be found, are often very complex. Nowhere is that more evident than in the media these past few months, when we see a diversity of opinions and perspectives regarding refugees or regarding terrorist activities. In addition to this diversity of opinion, we see diversity in lifestyle and in religious belief and in attitudes and values and principles. Often there is contention with this diversity and the contention that this diversity can bring has its flame spanned by media and social media. Since we have an abundance of ways to share and too often some would say overshare that contention. Social media sometimes has a lot to answer for. However, this isn't just something we read about. The diversity of culture and perspectives will only widen in the years to come. Statistics Canada data from 2006 and 2011 already indicates that 20% of residents were not born here. 41% of current Canadians were either first or second generation immigrants, and projections indicate that by 2031, more than half of Canadians over the age of 15 will either be foreign-born or will have one foreign-born parent. So just think for a minute how much, that, how much diversity that will bring to our daily lives. We will need more than ever policies that reflect and respect that diversity. And we will need to share the responsibility of understanding and accepting the gifts that others have to offer. So now I've shared with you what I think is important and a little bit about why I think it's important. I think I'd be a bit remiss in not also sharing a few things that you can do if you think this is important too. As a community development officer with the government of Alberta, I often find myself in a neutral facilitator role, helping groups to collect their insights, make sense of them, and then adapt them to policy. The literal translation of facilitate means to make easy. A facilitator is charged with making it easy for groups of people with a variety of opinions and perspectives to decide on a course of action collectively that has the consensus and the commitment of the group behind it. In leading and designing these sessions, I found one thing. I found that what we share in common greatly outweighs our differences. I've also learned a few tips and tricks that one can apply to life as well as to facilitation. So I'm gonna start with just a quick show of hands. This is a little experiment. I'm gonna have a few of them here. Those of you watching the video can do this at home. Who would like to learn some ways to manage diversity and build consensus? Okay, 
I see a few hands, more coming up, thank you. Now, let's put those hands back up again and quickly look at the person next to you that doesn't have their hands up. Okay, now I see a few more hands coming up, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, it doesn't matter that you joined in late, it just matters that you did join in. So this brings me to my first point, get involved. Those of you early birds that put your hands up have already learned this. You can't make a difference if you don't get involved. One of the hardest things for policymakers and decision makers to do is to be able to find out how people feel about things before they've made the wrong decision. So how can we participate in that? Fill out the surveys that are being sent out. Go to town hall meetings. Talk to a school board trustee. Take in a municipal council session. And if you can't show up in person, watch it on TV. Join a board or a committee, or get involved in your neighborhood association. Whether you do a little or a lot, show up. Now, I'd like to try something a little bit different. I'd like those of you that had your hands up to point to somebody that you noticed that didn't have their hands up. Okay, there we go. We got one person ratting out somebody else. Uh, we only need to do this for a second. We don't need to mock them. Um, but this illustrates what happens when you don't get involved. Often what happens is that others will speak for you. And often, they don't get it right. This also illustrates another point, that it can feel very uncomfortable to share when you're not ready. My next story is about a fellow who had developmental de delays. We were doing a visioning session with a club that he belonged to. When the introductions were made and the activities for the evening were announced, he took me aside and apologized and said that he'd be leaving. He was worried that I would feel bad or offended that if he left without explaining why, and that it had nothing to do with me or my presentation style. Even though he was with a group of his friends, many who had challenges very similar to his, he said that he did not feel comfortable participating because he felt that the work would be beyond him. I tried to explain to him that I was aware of his and of the group's challenges and that my design included storytelling and drawing, things that wouldn't require written words for the evening. He was a bit intrigued, but he still said, no, I don't want to be involved. I'm uncomfortable in situations like this, and I'm not up to trying again. I spoke to him about how even watching from the sidelines is a form of participation, and then I invited him to stay again, explaining that he could still leave whenever he wanted, that was fine, he said. He'd give it a try, but told me not to be too surprised if he changed his mind and left. Fair enough, I said. The rest of the participants had a lot of fun with the exercise. Of course, everyone was a little bit nervous at first, especially when we started drawing, but once they got over drawing anxiety, the stories started coming and the conversations just bubbled. The next thing I knew, I get a little tap on my shoulder. Would it be okay if I joined the rest of the group, he asked. You bet, I said, which illustrates my next point. Encourage others and create a safe environment so people can feel comfortable enough to participate. By listening to and accepting other people's stories, you make it possible for others to feel comfortable and to open up. By inviting people to share, you also encourage them to participate. Remember those activities and ideas I had before? Bring a friend to one of those meetings. Post the events on your Facebook site. Tweet about the issues that are important to you to create awareness, but do it respectfully. Invite newcomers to your community to participate in, in your events. Now, some of you might not have felt comfortable raising your hands earlier because you felt that this might not have been a safe environment. Yikes, it's a TED Talk, they're filming. But I'm going to promise you that none of the cameramen will, um, and women will film what's happening in the audience. So I'm going to create a bit of a safe environment here for you. And I'm going to do another little experiment. 
What I'd like you to do is to take your right hand, cross it over your chest, just underneath your shoulder, and rest it there for a moment. Okay, good. I'm seeing a lot more people participating, which is fantastic, and you can put your hands down for a moment now. So it brings me to my next point. Be prepared to change your mind. This point is especially true for those that are designing sessions where others are telling their stories. Showing acceptance can mean that your own perspective might change after hearing about somebody else's experience. It also shows an important responsibility that you have when asking people to share, and that is that the decisions that you make and that the policies that you develop need to reflect the wisdom of the people that have shared the, that story with you. When I teach sessions in community engagement to other people, quite often as part of the exercise, I will have the host ask a very particular question as people file in. And that question is, what do you like to drink? And then what I get the host to do, I'm pretty sneaky about this, I get them to mess up the order. So if you ask for coffee, cream and sugar, you might get coffee black or a glass of water or nothing at all. Later on in the training, I ask people how they felt when they didn't get what they asked for. Most people say that they were disappointed or that they were annoyed. And then I tell them, we never did promise that we'd get you that drink. We were just asking about your drinking preferences. We were just doing a survey. We asked, what do you like? Not, what can I get you? That's not fair, they'll say. Just asking the question was enough to raise the expectation that you would get a sour drink. And so too, there's the responsibility that when you go to your community or out to your stakeholders and ask them to share their wisdom, you will respond to what they say because now you've created the expectation that you will honor their contributions. And that's a very important promise to make. Before you leave, I'd like to ask you to make another promise, this time to yourself. I'd like to challenge not just your thinking, but also your doing. I know that if you can challenge one person's perspective or understanding about something, you can change everything. So I'm going to challenge you to do two things. The first is to share one story of yours that may change somebody else's understanding or perspective about something. And second is to listen Really listen and accept at least one story from somebody who doesn't think like you do. It can change your mind, and it might even change your life. So finally, one more exercise. I'd like to invite those of you that can and feel comfortable about doing this to very quickly stand up. And in the spot in front of your seat, turn around in a 360-degree circle. And those of you watching on video can do this at home, too. Thank you. You can sit down. I wanted you to do these three exercises. The first one was raising your hand. The second one was placing it on your shoulder. And the third one, of course, spinning around. Because I wanted you to be able to say, after your time here, that you got involved that this touched your heart, <laughs> and that it turned your life around. <laughs> Thank you. Now, go out there and turn somebody else's life around. Thank you very much.